Thank you for uh, all of you. You're welcome for the first discussion. I can't, Mahesh Uran is here. Okay. Mahesh, I can see him. Okay. So, <clears> HCC, <throat> um, our, our key point is to educate youngsters on the key decision making points and the waypoints in HCC management. Uh, I think there is a slide that's open. Um, so I'll give you a brief algorithm and then we can, I'll also share the slides with you. So our, my first decision making point is on the performance status. So we go by the ECOG status and an ECOG status less than two, where the patient is ambulant more than 50% of the time is considered a good performance status and anything on the other side is a poor performance status. That's the first one which makes a difference. A patient with a poor performance status straight away goes into palliative care or best supportive care. Uh, in a patient with good child abuse status, uh, a good performance status, we go into the child abuse status and we divide it into two. Child A and B7 and anything more than B8 or C. So this will indicate their a rough liver function. You also can use a MELT score of 10 or 12 which is again variable. A good performance status, we go into the child abuse status. Uh, is my voice clear? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So for, for both, uh, in a child B8 or C, we do a negative workup for liver metastasis. We assess vascular invasion on CT scan and we see whether transplant criteria are met. We are going to, uh, we have a, a panel, Dr. Hema, hepatology, and uh, Dr. Maheshwaran uh, to join us. We'll give you the details, but I just want to give a brief overview before we actually go through the details. Uh, on the transplant criteria, there are several criteria. The classical, most well-established is the Milan one, followed by the UCSF. Uh, currently, we follow the up to seven criteria, and there are some units in India which follow the any size, any number criteria. So once your transplant criteria is satisfied, you can go ahead with transplantation. Uh, we will answer a few questions regarding this. If the transplant criteria is not met, despite a negative workup and a vascular, no vascular invasion, when the, child, when the person has a poor uh, liver function status, palliative or best supportive care is, is probably the only option available. Sorafenib has not been tested well in child C patients, but some people can give this as an experimental therapy. For child A or B7, those with a good liver function, we also do the work of for liver metastasis. Uh, we'll give you the details on that. And if the metastasis workup shows positive lesions in the liver, uh, in the lung, or in the, in the bone, then medical treatment is the only option. We'll discuss the different parts of the medical treatment. And if the workup for liver metastasis is negative, we look for macrovascular invasion, meaning whether there is an invasion of the portal vein or the hepatic veins. In the absence of, uh, in the presence of a macrovascular invasion, we take them back to the medical treatment. That's the only option available for them. And in the absence of a macrovascular lesions, we decide um, how many lesions do the patients have. Uh, we, I have subclassified it to two, one to three lesions and more than four lesions. More than four lesions are being treated in some places with bridging therapies or downstaging and take them to transplantation. But the classical recommendation for a, for a student or a young surgeon is that anything more than four uh, lesions, medical treatment probably will work better. And uh, one to three lesions, again, I have subclassified them into single lesions or multiple lesions. And I have broken down the single lesions size-wise so that you can go through the entire one. In multiple lesions, I have classified them into the largest size, the cumulative size, and also the presence of high AFPs, which can affect the tumor. So we are going to do all this. This is, this is the rough one. Hello, sir. A lot. Yeah. Sir, the slide is not going to change. Sir. It's not changing, sir. Uh, this is this is not a slide. It's a mind map. You got it? No, sir. We can see only the first uh, no. the algorithm. Sir, he is just uh, the first slide only. He'll move further. He is not move the slides. Okay. Uh, can you see? I I thought this is uh, this is moving. Each one is a different different set actually. 
uh, can you can you see this now each one is adding up more and more uh, uh, ilango what he says is that the mind map is that the the what of the chart the, the, uh, you move from that right as you as no no this is the one this is the one which we are going to discuss with this this is yeah. the only mind map we have put up yes right and i'll sh i'll share the next slide okay so this is how we are going to frame our discussion so uh, mahesh are you here yeah yeah so we we start with the first question to you mm -hmm. uh, whenever you see a patient with a diagnosed hcc referred to you mm -hmm. uh, how do you use the performance status assessment in your practice see simple thing that you can ask from the history alone how how long the patient can walk without any help without any breathlessness and any other issues and also we can ask whether the patients are able to do their daily living activity um, and uh, also um, whether they are bed bound whether they are you know um, wheelchair bound all this information we can get from the history alone then we can categorize them according to the ecog performance status uh, and if you want to do a, you know like eyeball test you can ask the patient to walk like you can ask the patient to walk like 20 meters and up and down and see how long will they take like more than five, you know if they can take probably about 12 13 uh, you know sorry if they walk uh, for example 10 meters one end to another end taking about like 30 seconds or something like that then it's a give a rough idea but if you want an objective way of assessing the performance status we can do what's called the cpex test where you can have a cardiopulmonary assessment by asking to do some biking and you can calculate the met score which will help us to decide whether this patient is fit for surgery or not that is the way that we assess the performance rate. thank you so uh, do you agree with the um, algorithm that if you have a poor performance status, regardless of the uh, tumor uh, status, you would defer the treatment to best supportive care? Of course. See, the, there are, uh, I think, uh, so far we have almost more than 15 staging systems for us. Everyone has got their own way of, you know, describing what is the best way of management. So far, most of them will follow what's called the BCLC criteria, where it Actually, it gives information to the performance status. And it clearly says any performance status more than two, they come under the category of you know poor performance status or the advanced stage. So in those patients, irrespective of the stage of the disease, they do very badly after the any procedure. So they are given usually palliative care. I think your perform poor performance status, what you explained about more than two, is definitely I agree with that. Thank you. We go into the uh, patients with good performance status, mm -hmm. and then um, the next step is the evaluation of the liver status. Um, so, with the liver status, we divide them into two categories child A and B7, and uh, child B8 and C. They, those are the bad livers, their, their liver function is not good. So, um, on both the sides, we, our workup is for uh, liver metastasis. My next question is to Dr. Hema. Hema, are you there? Hema? I'm here. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So, um, what, what is the standard uh, workup that you do in your practice for uh, metastatic evaluation? So, uh, metastatic evaluation, so ideally uh, a chest CT and a bone scan that is done. And nowadays, that is to look for metastasis. But nowadays, if you have PET CT, if it is available, many centers are incorporating that also in the evaluation for liver metastasis. For eval after the diagnosis is confirmed. So, uh, uh, the, the HCC is not normally a PET avid tumor. So, in that case, how do you use that information? So, so the PET CT cannot be used for a diagnosis of HCC. So once a diagnosis is established for a HCC, it can be used to one to diagnose the metastasis and also to look at the FDG avidity, PET avidity. So the tumors which have a very high avidity, you can it's an indirect marker for uh, the uh, biological aggressiveness of the disease. 
But if you do not have PET CT, the standard recommended one is chest CT and a bone scan. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, so that I think so for young. Can I, add, can I add one thing over there? Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so regarding this PET CT, you know, Dr. Hammer clearly explained why we have to do PET CT. You know, obviously we all know HCs is not a FDG avid tumor. So I had a chat with one of our uh, nuclear medicine consultant. What they said is, if the HCs is well differentiated, they won't have any uptake of the patient. But the the tumor is poorly differentiated, then they'll take up they'll have uptake on the liver itself. And again, the PET scan is may not be useful if the disease is limited to the liver because they won't show any uptake if it is well differentiated, then it's completely a waste of the investigation. But if you are look, looking for a metastatic workup, if you do PET CT, if the tumor is outside the liver, definitely they'll have an uptake. That's that's what uh, uh, you, you take questions from the floor as you go on. Yes, sir. We can do that. We can yeah, clarify. Uh, Niket Shah, what is your uh, question? Uh, sir, uh, good evening, sir. Sir, slides are not expanding, sir. Even that tick uh, and uh, plus, uh, nothing is expanding, sir. We are seeing the same slide uh, from the first minute, sir. Uh, this is actually not a slide, Dr. Niket. This is a mind mapping tool. Can you yes, see sir, that? It's, it's not expanding, sir. It's the okay. same, sir. It's child A only we can see. Child A bar B7. Beyond that, we can't see anything, sir. Okay. Let, let me refresh it, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ankit, what is your question? Uh, sir, uh, there are two approach for metastatic. Uh, sir, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, for metastatic workup, uh, one side we have CT chest and bone scan, and second side we have PET CT. So, if both options are available, what should what is the preferred uh, option? Hema to answer. So. Uh... So if, if both are available, so that is the your question, right? If both you have PET CT, bone scan, and then uh, a chest CT. Yes, so yes. I think I am I am doing now more of PET CT because uh, uh, it, it comprehensive. It, it also has advantage of doing the CT scan. So especially if it has, it, the, the primary CT was done in another center, so we need a CT scan of the abdomen in our institute. So we get all, everything in a single imaging. So patient gets referred from outside the center for a HCC. Uh, so now I need one imaging in my center to see how it's the vascular involvement. And I also need a, a imaging for the metastasis. So then if I have a PET CT in my institute, I will do that PET with CT because in single imaging, I'll get all the information. But if I don't have it, it is okay. Chest CT and a bone scan is will do. Ankit? Are you okay, Ankit? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Am I sir? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, I wanted to know, like, what are the indications for metastatic workup, sir, in HCC? All patients. It's like a standard cancer workup. See, okay. in HCC, the disease has two parts. The disease has a tumor part and the disease has a liver component as well. You need to assess both. So, uh, I don't want you uh, to get confused. We, we want to keep it very simple. Uh, there are several ways one can assess a liver status and uh, several ways of assessing the tumor. What we are trying to teach is a very simple method so that you can recollect and do as good as possible for the patient in front of you. That's, that's our aim. And in the discussion, you can, you can ask your questions and we will we'll be able to give you more and more information. Okay, is that yeah. clear, Dr. Yeah. Ankit? Okay, all right. So we have the worker for liver metastasis and um, <clears throat> Uh, so I would like to take the next question on the advanced liver side. You have a negative workup for liver metastasis and there is no macrovascular invasion. And uh, a patient with a bad liver disease and a, and a tumor is, uh, is uh, one of the patients, can, they can be one of the best treatments is transplantation. So uh, my first question is to uh, Dr. Hema. What is the transplant criteria that you use in practice? So the standard criteria, which is uh, used all over the world is the Milan criteria. So what it basically looks at is the number of lesions and the total size of the lesions. So less than three lesions and total tumor volume less than five centimeter. So why this criteria was chosen was 
because it is a tumor, it is a malignancy. So after transplant, when you give an immunosuppression, there is a risk of recurrence. So they want to, be, uh, transplant is a very uh, labor intensive procedure. So they want to choose a patient in which the risk of recurrence is very less. So that is why this Milan criteria was chosen in which the risk of recurrence is less than 10%. But then they found that it was too restrictive. So then they expanded it to UCSF criteria in which total size of the lesions, that is if you have multiple lesion, total size should be less than eight centimeter and a single lesion less than 4.5 centimeter. So we are using the UCSF criteria in, in our practice here. Uh, so if it is within that, the patient with a HCC, if the patient is within the UCSF criteria, we subject him for transplant evaluation. Uh, Ilango, uh, do you have a uh, slide on your screen or is it a plain screen now? Sir, uh, I have the my mind map and I have one more screen on that uh, for the slide. It's with only the, plain uh, screen now. You, you, you have to share the screen. Uh, okay, let me let me share again. Meanwhile, uh, there's a question uh, to uh, Dr. Hema. Is it acetate pet? I don't know what is mean. Is it acetate pet? Acetate pet, uh, I am not familiar. Somebody <laughs> asked. Is familiar. And uh, another question is how to differentiate between multifocal HCC, HCC with intrahepatic metastasis. How does it affect management? I think uh, maybe so, we'll address that. Maharaj? Yeah, I think. Uh, it's very difficult to differentiate multifocal HCC with the HCC with the intrahepatic metastasis unless, you know, uh, because both present similarly on the CT scan. And uh, even if you take a tissue biopsy, it's going to be the similar on both. Uh, How does it affect the management? Entry. So it's very difficult to differentiate between multifocal. Sir, so if there is a multiple, obviously we need to, as Ilango rightly mentioned, for any HCC, there are two uh, two uh, factors that we need to consider. One, how bad the liver function is, how bad the tumor is. So we need to calculate, we need to assess the liver function separately and the tumor burden separately. Depending upon the tumor burden, then we need to tailor our management. And as Dr. Hema said, we use Milan as well as the UCS of criteria. And there are other criteria that we can use to decide whether, you know, which treatment option is better for the patient, especially if you are proceeding for a transplant, then we have some more criteria that we take into consideration, like how high the AFP is, if the AFP is more than 400, or if the tumor is FTG, avid, as I mentioned earlier, the most of the FTG avid tumors in the liver are very poorly differentiated. So that gives kind of, you know, information to us saying that these um, uh, HCC is going to recur even after transplantation. So we use certain criteria, but majority of the centers in the world, they stick with either Milan or uses of criteria. And then if even if the patient goes beyond this criteria, then we have to assess the suitability of what's called a bridging therapy for the patient, where you can try and do something to downstage the disease and then to put them on the transplant list. I think I, 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 my, I assume Yulungu is going to discuss that next. That's why I'm keeping quiet on it. But, but sir, I'll have to, something is, uh, some problem with the screen sharing. I'll uh -huh. just leave the meeting and join again. Right, fine. M meanwhile, I ask uh, Dr. Hema to open the chat box and there are certain questions. Uh, Oh, yeah, I'm seeing the question, sir. So one, uh, I will go for the last, Raghavendra Gupta has asked, as meld exception points are limited to Milan criteria only and not UCSF, so, so will selection differ based on disease or living donor? So yes, so definitely. So uh, the West, it, it, in West, it is predominantly disease donor. So because organ are so limited, so they use the meld exception because these HCC patients are very low meld. So where the allocation is based on meld, so they will never get a chance. So they have meld exception points. So for that, they are using Milan criteria. Uh, they are not using UC UCSF criteria. But here uh, in the East or in India, we are having predominantly living donors. So that is where we are going for the UCSF criteria. Okay. Okay. The screen is back. Yeah, you can continue. All right. So, um, so a brief overview. I just wanted you to know that there are multiple criteria for selecting transplants. And most of the surgeons are going more and more aggressive with uh, with uh, with transplant criteria. So we have progressed from Milan, and then we have gone to UCSF, 
And then uh, there are people who use the up to seven criteria in some of the tumors. And uh, we also have the Metro ticket, which, uh, which is online. You can do the Metro ticket calculation and then assess. But the bottom line is that you must have at least 70% survival at five years. So that is the basic criteria by which allocation happens in the West. Remember that most of these allocation criteria are based on disease donor transplantation and they don't want the list to be flooded with HCC patients at the risk to other patients. So they have got these restrictions. The US never changed this uh, criteria from Milan uh, because, uh, and they provided some meld exception points for them to get the allocation. So if, you, if the patient satisfies the uh, transplantation criteria, uh, they go ahead with transplantation. And if they do not, the uh, treatment is best supportive care or palliative care. We do have some questions on transplantation, uh, which I think uh, Mahesh can answer at this point of time before we go to the case capsules. And um, what is the question? Yeah, you can open the chat, uh, Mahesh. Okay, okay. okay. Chat yeah. box. So, my first Can question uh, to him is, uh, what kind of intraoperative issues do uh, you anticipate in the liver transplant? See, when we, uh, when we list the patient for liver transplant, as, um, you know, obviously we expect, obviously we know this is a cancer and there is a possibility it might have progressed before, you know, we transplant the patient. So we always have a backup. That is the main thing that we have to have any HCC patient being listed. If they are about to come for transplant, we should have a backup in case if that disease is progressed and he's not, you know, a uh, candidate for transplant anymore. So first of all, whenever we do transplant for HCC patient, we open and try and see whether there is any uh, obvious, you know, uh, spread, example, peritoneal metastasis, or um, rather than expected uh, few tumors, we have like a multiple tumors or something like that, then we need to think about whether are we going to do this futile transplant or not. Sometimes we may abandon the transplant and offer the liver to the next patient. The second problem that we encountered during liver transplantation for HCC patient, if they have had a bridging therapy, for example, if they had a taste, if they had an ablation procedure or something like that, then it's going to be really, really challenging to, you know, divide all those, you know, uh, usually the tumor will stuck with the diaphragm or we may have to take a bit of diaphragm off or we may have some difficulty in during the dissection. The third uh, difficulty that we may encounter during HCC, sometimes, the HCCs are within Milan criteria, but they may be very close to the uh, vessels, especially close to the um, you know hepatic veins. We may think sometimes it's very easy; it will come out, you know, by just taking along with the vein. But sometimes it may extend beyond that. So these are the things I think we encounter, especially for HCC patient. And I can I can tell you know put my hand in my heart saying that majority of the time you don't expect all these things. Most of the time the transplant for HCC is the one that goes very smoothly. Yeah, yeah. I always remember that um, in US during our training there years, they used to call this the fellow case. Yeah, so that's correct. much more easier dissections and yeah. uh, absolutely no blood loss. It's right. very important to have minimal blood loss in a patient who undergoes transplantation for HCC because the uh, estimated blood loss and the amount of uh, transfusions has uh, has an impact on the uh, outcome, the recurrence of the lesion. So that is a brief overview. I don't want to go into the details. We can provide more details uh, on that. Uh, if I can interrupt, uh, you know, there are some questions piling up in the chat box. We have a huge audience today. Uh, can we uh, uh, do a, the, get it out of the backlog and then proceed? Do I yeah. Yes, yes I can take it up. So uh, uh, the extended criteria for transplant, uh, Dr. Mahesh and Yelongo dis discuss multiple criteria there. And then, um, uh, uh, how do you manage a patient of HCC while awaiting while waiting for liver transplant? How do you ensure or follow to see whether tumor is progressing? So, how do you manage the patient when he is waiting for liver transplant? That is the question. So, I think Dr. Longo, I am not sure whether he's going to discuss. So, once we list the patient for a liver transplant, so there is a waiting time. It may be three months. It may be six months, especially for DDLT. So we need to offer what we call as a downstaging or a bridging therapy. So downstaging means it is outside UCSF and then you want to bring it inside the UCSF or Milan criteria. Bridging therapy means it is within the criteria, but during the waiting period, we do not want the tumor to progress. So that is a bridging therapy. So what therapies we offer, most usually most common which we offer is the TACE. 
So we offer that. And after offering that, we follow the patient with imaging, usually at four weeks and then every three months. So I hope that answers that question. What, then what can you use to assess liver function? So we are not really, in practice, we are not really using any scan for uh, liver function. ICG tests are done in Japan. So we are assessing the liver function, so that the synthetic function, mainly by the, the liver function test, that is the albumin, the INR, the prothrombin time, the INR, the platelets. The platelets, if it is very low, that means the portal hypertension is very high. So the reason we do all this in case the patient is going to go for resection. So the residual liver should be enough to regenerate and the residual liver function should be good. So we are primarily going by the, uh, the blood test and the endoscopy. That is, if it is large varices, that means it is already really a shrunken liver so that will not regenerate. So it is not a candidate for liver resection. So he has to go for a, probably a liver transplant. That's how we you assess the liver function. Any role for hepatic artery chemo infusion? Yes, in advanced SCC, you can try it, but I think it is not commonly used. I'm not sure if any centers are using here in India yet, but yes, it is in, used in Japan. How do we exclude prime, second primary in SCC and how common? So I am not understand second primary. You mean recurrence? Maybe you can clarify that to yeah. him. Mm. Yeah, okay, I think, Ayesh or uh, Ilango, can you take that? Yeah, so, yeah. How, how do we exclude a second primary in HCC? Just don't look for it. It's <laughs> always multifocal. You just say, label it as multifocal. It's right. much more simpler to decide. And if you think of it as a second primary, I mean, this is a, this is a liver with background cirrhosis most of the time. And it is a bad land with, uh, and any bad tree can grow there. So you should assume like that. So don't take it as a uh, second primary. It is multifocal disease. That's a simple one. So don't use ma confusing terms. So that'll help you decide faster. So well, I think, you, uh, you proceed with your uh, uh, discussion. And then uh, after this particular point of discussion, we'll come back to the chat. Because see, uh, as you see, learning general surgery, the audience are the kings. <laughs> yes, sir. OK. We are not. So, <clears throat> So yeah. once the workup of the uh, liver meds is negative, we look for micro macrovascular invasion. So um, I want to go through the whole whole thing uh, so that um, I can go to the individual slides from now on. Um, I'm going to sh change the uh, sharing screen to a PowerPoint presentation now. Did you get it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I'm going to do some cases. And now this is something which I, which is our standard liver mass evaluation. We, um, for teaching purposes, we call it the WILT evaluation, which stands for viral markers, imaging, liver function tests, and tumor markers. And apart from the WILT evaluation, we also look for portal hypertension, and uh, and a cancer screening as well. So. Um, the viral markers that are done are hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HPC, uh, Hep B, EAG, all those things for uh, patients with Hep B cirrhosis and anti-HCV. I think uh, the two markers which are commonly done are anti-HCV and uh, HPSAG. The imaging is a triphasic CT scan and, uh, uh, and the reporting is now standardized as uh, LIRADS, which stands for liver imaging reporting. Uh, standards, you have to, the HCC is diagnosed as the ones which are labeled as LIRADS 4 and 5. That will be discussed in detail in part 2. You can join for that discussion. The imaging should also include the CT chest. So now this has evolved into the PET CT whole PET CT for metastatic evaluation. Uh, this, uh, the use of chest CT was common in tumors within Milan criteria in the US. And once they crossed beyond the Milan's criteria, they were using the bone scan. But after we started practicing in India and then HCC, I mean, uh, we were doing transplants here and PET-CT was easily available. We started doing the PET-CT as a part of our evaluation. Obviously liver function tests and tumor markers, we do AFP. The other two markers are for any standard liver mass evaluation. So I have given the cutoff values. And for portal hypertension, a clinically significant portal hypertension, we look for upper GI endoscopy and uh, liver Doppler. We also look at the platelet count, as Dr. Hamer was saying. 
And for this is a standard liver mass evaluation. We have to look for colonoscopy to look for any other primary because we're not always dealing with HCC all the time. So let's go into the clinical scenarios. Now, this is how a Lyrite 4 5 acts up. It's called an arterial hyperenhancement with a venous washout. And it's very good if, you, if your uh, radiologist is able to demonstrate this, uh, this washout. So that's for the youngsters. Now, the first question uh, is to Mahesh. Yeah. Uh, you have a 45 year old ma male with Nash cirrhosis, good performance status, mm -hmm. and he has a HCC uh, detected on screening, which is about two centimeters. Mm -hmm. So, our uh, primary questions are. Um, this is query Nash cirrhosis. Uh, I have given a protocol which I have been following. So it's to do a fibro scan, 12.5 kilopascals. You think of as uh, fibrosis. And we also, and in, in places where we don't have fibro scan, I always do a biopsy of the non tumor liver to eat the perfect assessment. My question to you is that mm -hmm. if the presence of HCC two centimeters warrants resection or transplant, what is your take? So again, going to the basic liver uh, status and the tumor status. If the liver status is child's A, looking at this 45 years old, good performance status, I don't know anything about the child status. If it is child's A and uh, the tumor is only two centimeter. So here we have a lot of options and uh, the literature supports resection is the best way of, you know, treating these patients. But Nowadays, the other options like RFAs or even uh, taste, if they have a good arterial uh, supply uh, to the specific tumor, or even sometimes they may say SBRT, all those things are now evolving way of you know, treating the small HCCs. But the standard of care is if the patient is child's A and good performance status, resection would be the option, best option for the patient. Uh, Hema, would you like to add any other points on a two centimeter HCC in a query Nash cirrhosis? So it's so less than two centimeter, two centimeter or less than the RFA is also equally effective. Correct. When you look at the short term or even three years, it is equally effective, and it is uh, we are it is less invasive than a surgery. So in fact, uh, uh, the many many guidelines would suggest that it is two centimeter or less, even if it is a cirrhotic. So RFA is probably preferred and you go for, if there is a recurrence of a salvage resection or a salvage transplant, if there is recurrence. So I would prob probably put this patient for an RFA rather than a resection, if it comes to me. <laughs> Correct. So uh, now I'm caught between the two. So this is how I have been, <laughs> I have been practicing. So uh, the, the idea is to confirm the presence of cirrhosis and the presence of cirrhosis, I have to assess the risk of post-operative liver failure. So I presume this is not a DCLD. Uh, that is how we are going to discuss now. So I found out some very good criteria. These are from Italy. They, uh, they, have, they have used this, the right low volume to body weight ratio less than 1.4 and clinically significant port hypertension. Those are the two assessments that they have done. So it is like this. If you have a large right low, in a small individual, that ratio will be met. And with normal portal pressure, it is safe to proceed with less than two segment resection. Like Dr. Hema said, less, two centimeter tumors are also best treated by radiofrequency ablation. I'll give you some statistics in the next uh, few slides. And the question of surgery usually arises for lesions above three centimeters. Now, if you have a very small right lobe in a, in a cirrhotic patient, or the patient is a really large built with a normal size liver, or there is very significant portal hypertension like grade two varices, large spleen, a platelet count less than one, one lakh. It is, those patients are not going to do very well. So what I do is, those are the patients I do RFA, and if they, I don't have RFA, I do percutaneous ethanol injections, and then that's a bridge therapy, and my ultimate aim is to plan for uh, liver transplantation. So in these tumors, I use radiofrequency ablation. So I have taken a slightly, slight, slightly more uh, uh, a confusing situation. Let, let's say if we add up 
another 0.5 centimeters in a cirrhotic patient. Uh, and I have asked the same question, ablation, resection, or transplantation. So these are the tumors where I have been doing surgery. Mahesh, you can actually uh, jut in and give your points. You can you can always uh, interrupt at any time when you feel like. If I can interrupt just for a minute. Uh, yeah. There's another group following me on the Facebook. And Ilango, you have, uh, the, Vema, you have a question. What are all the medications included in bridging therapy? This is by Ganesh Gangadhar in this question. So, uh, there is no medication as such. Yeah. So you are managing the liver failure if he has any. Uh, if he has portal hypertension, we put them on beta blockers. It is mainly bridging therapy is usually a loco regional therapy. So loco regional therapy is usually interventional radiological procedures, either a TACE or an RFA. Okay, thank you. Uh, carry on, Lago. Okay, so um, uh, this is where I do surgery. They are left lobe lesions where you can do a left lateral segmentectomy and um, superficial or surface lesions where you can do a non-anatomical resection with good margins. Lesions that lie on the lower border of the liver, that is in uh, segment three, four B, five and six. Those are the lower border of the liver. It's very easy to tackle that. You can do that. And um, livers that are not shrunken. I mean, you, you don't have to use this right low volume by weight all the time. So what you can do is, uh, look for the uh, size of the liver on the CT scan. If it lies within the costal margin, it is a shrunken liver. It is, it is quite dangerous to do surgery on that liver. And uh, they should also have normal portal pressure. So these are the lesions when I do, where I do uh, resections. Can I add one more point, Tilango? Yeah. There is a tool on the Mayo Clinic uh, website. It's actually assessing the risk of surgery in a patient with cirrhosis, irrespective of whether it's a liver surgery or it is a bowel surgery, whatever surgery, it gives very good risk assessment score for the patients. And um, where you have to put all the information, including your uh, albumin, the MEL score and the age and all those things that we give, it gives your, the, the, the risk, for example, seven day mortality, 30 day mortality, uh, 90 days mortality, and all those information which will help us to counsel the patient very well. When we do the surgery, this is going to be the risk. And actually, as we all know, it's a collective decision. Once we all agree to go ahead with the resection, then yes, we can go ahead with the resection. The second point is the child, you said child uh, Q score of B7, right? That is a cutoff. The similar thing, there is a melt cutoff, 12. 12 is a melt cutoff. Any patients who has got melt score of more than 12, they do badly with the surgery. So in those patients, we have to take a step back saying that what other options are available. And what Dr. Hamas is correct, any, any uh, lesions like two or below, then RFA would be an option. And what you also said, like the segment uh, three, four uh, B, five, six, as well as the superficial lesions. Uh, one thing, they are easily resectable by laparoscopic method. So you're not doing any major surgery for the patient. Number two, I've spoken to the radiologists. What they said is if the lesions are very superficial, sometimes they may find difficulty in accessing the lesions with an ultrasound guided probe. So they may struggle. So in those situations, rather than you know uh, proceeding for uh, local regional therapy, but it, it's easy for surgical surgeons to uh, remove the tumor you know, very easily. So we can go ahead with the reception. Some questions in the chat box. Can I take it? Yeah, yeah sure, Rema. Uh, I'll have a announcement. Meanwhile, if anyone from the audience wanted to ask a question, please raise your hand in the uh, the uh, in your uh, box, right? Then I, we, otherwise, you don't know who wants because a lot of mics are open. So I don't want them to be open. Yeah, uh, Hema. So, so I'm, so, I'm taking so, one question. They said, "Is biopsy mandatory, mandatory to prove it's easy in patients with a background of cirrhosis?" No, it's. Uh, and previously, we never biopsy the HCC. The reason being, when we try to do a biopsy, we may have a risk of tumor seedling on the needle tract that may preclude the option of transplantation in future if the patient develops a lesion over there. That is the only reason uh, we don't do HCC, but actually it is a backfire for us also because we don't take a lot of biopsy from HCC. And it's very difficult to assess the tumor biology in majority of the situation before we plan for any definitive treatment. Uh, Consider location of the lesion if closer to major vessels, uh, then RFA will be difficult. That's absolutely right. Any lesion which is very close to the major vessels, RFA cannot be done. But there is another option called microwave ablation, 
which can be done. But again, the number of uh, the, the dose of the microwave ablation that we give should be less in the perivascular region compared to the other regions. We can achieve some control if the lesion is situated, you know, uh, sitting very close to the major vessels. But if we have the lesion away from the vessel, we can have complete, you know, uh, necrosis of the tumor that we can achieve. Sometimes when you take the liver out during transplantation, if the biopsy result, come, the histology come back as no active tumor. So I've taken a couple of questions. Hema, do you want to take some questions as well? So there's one question about how is usefulness of PIVCA marker in a clinical practice? So the protein induced by vitamin K antagonism. So we are using it. So if we have a tu liver tumor, which the imaging is typical of FCC, but the AFP is normal, normally we do PIVCA, which is usually high. So we use that as a diagnostic, and then it can also be used in the prognosis. That is, you do a local regional therapy, and then you can also see if it's going to come down. So we are using it in patients in, which, in whom AFP is uh, normal. Then I have some questions below which says, do you look for portal hypertension before deciding for liver resection? That is the most single most important component, component to look for before you go for liver resection. How to look for it? I think they have already discussed. So clinically significant portal hypertension is defined as less than 10 millimeters of mercury. So how do you know if the, that is done by a transjugular measurement? So that is not available in all centers. So how do you know it? So if there is if there is varices by endoscopy, platelets less than one lakh, the patient has clinically significant uh, portal hypertension. And uh, okay, so we can go ahead, no? Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, let me close the chat. Okay. So a tumor less than three centimeters, if you do an ablative procedure, you achieve about 15 to 90% necrosis of the tumor. So as the size increases, size of the lesion increases, the percentage of tumor that gets necrosed gets drops and the, and the technique also becomes complicated. You have to have multiple passes and it's not very accurate. So the incomplete treatment rates really become high. So I also wanted to look at whether transplantation is better in this situation. So I. I started getting this uh, data, this is from multiple sources. Your transplant one year survival standard should be 85. So that's the standard all over the world. Your five year transplant survival should be 70. So these are, these are from UNOS, you cannot break that. So most of the um, diseases will meet this criteria and um, the, the no, this is the normal risk of the liver transplant. So if you look at ablation, it achieves somewhere between 78 to 100 percentage at one year, which is almost similar to that you achieve by transplantation. So transplantation is a, has an additional uh, disadvantage of lifelong immunosuppression. So if you can achieve the same one year survival with ablation, a short term course, you have to, it is better for you to choose ablation. Now, ablation, the five year survival has not been reported. If you see the five year survival in transplant is really better. So if the patient is going to survive long, transplantation seems like a better option. So via media, we choose if the CTP is more than B7 or the MELS score more than 15, transplant is probably the best option. I think a MELS score of more than 12 also makes the transplant a better option, okay? And if you compare surgery versus RFA, your one year survival is almost equal to RFA. But if you go and look at the three-year survivals, surgery actually has a definitely better result compared to RFA in, uh, in, in, the, in the selected patients. Okay, you must be very clear. And some factors that you should remember about ablation. We'll go into the individual details in the next one, but uh, I just want you to remember this. The ablation zone must extend beyond the tumor, about 10 to 20 millimeters. And... Um, you usually evaluate an ablation at around four weeks by a contrast enhanced CT scan. And you see the non-enhancing ablation zone should be more than five millimeters surrounding the non-tumor parenchyma. So in all places, you know, you don't have the radio frequency ablation or the micro microwave ablation. So you can also use absolute alcohol, which is available in most labs. The volume required is about for every centimeter of tumor, you require about 10 cc's of alcohol. So 10 ml of alcohol is required. People have also used acetic acid 50%. Um, 
and you require a slightly smaller volume for the same amount of necrosis. Ilango, if I can ask you, yeah, or even Mahesh can answer, what's the difference between RFA and microwave, and is there any very special separate indications for each of them? Uh, the, yeah, Mahesh? I think, I think um, previously we used a lot of RFAs, but the thing is, as Ilango rightly mentioned, you know, the, the, the heat sink effect is more with RFA than microwave, if I am yeah. right. That's the only so, difference, actually. Yeah. Both, both use heat um, to ablate the lesion, but the heat sink effect is less with microwave ablation. Microwave, yeah. That's it. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, the next scenario is a 62-year-old gentleman with fatty liver and HCC. Remember, this is, this is not cirrhosis. So, you just have a fatty liver and a HCC three centimeters in the right row. And um, obviously, the, you're not considering transplant because the liver is still good. And um, you, can remember, uh, you can remove or resect as much as 60% of the liver. So our treatment choice is not going to be different. So our treatment is going to be resection. What we should re re remember is that how much we can resect in a fatty liver. Do you need staged resection or effortal hypertrophy prior to resection? That means whether you need to decide about portal vein embolization. So um, the practical way is to decide that in a fatty liver or a compromise, any compromised liver, you have to leave at least 40% of future remnant liver. This is the safest one. And if in any way your remnant is going to be less than 40%, it is good to use portal vein embolization for that hypertrophy to happen. So, um, so that is one thing. Mahesh, do you have any disagreement with, I mean, you, you no, resect no. most of the fatty lesions yeah, in fatty yeah. liver. No, we have done a lot. Now, fatty liver is not a common. I mean, if you scan yeah. 100 people, at least 40-50% will have fatty liver anyway. So we cannot, you know, exclude fatty liver. But as you said, you know, the 40% is, I think, ideal for fatty liver. Even for cirrhotics, we leave almost like a 40%. If the very good uh, cirrhotics, we can still do resection with a uh, leaving FLR of 40%. So both are kind I got my hands. Um, um, Mahesh, uh, I, personally, I would disagree with that. Way. I burnt my hands a few times um, <laughs> doing, uh, trying to do major resections on cirrhosis. So I stick to less than two segments in cirrhosis whenever I find, uh, when I, when, whenever I'm operating on them. So, um, so with uh, NASH cirrhosis in tumors, um, please remember, uh, even in child aid tumors, you have to be very careful when you select surgeries. Don't do them in small livers. Don't do them in small right lobes. Don't do them in patients with significant portal hypertension. For fatty liver and liver tumor, you can assess for fibrosis using a fibroscan or a biopsy. And always limit to two segments or do stage two sections. So uh, for, for the record, a bad liver from the point of liver resection is a child B7 or more, a male more than 10. I'm even more conservative than Mahesh, who uses a melt of 12. Shrunken liver on image. Grade two varices. Presence of splenomegaly. Ascites, even small quantity is dangerous. And a platelet count of less than 100. Hema, you agree with all this? Yes. Yes. One, one thing I would like to add, Ilango, you know, all these criteria, I think I shared, a, I discussed a case with you with the bad liver, your point, like B7, mel 12 obese, diabetes. Yeah, yeah. Short stage, uh, we did a resection. I mean, it's a more, not only two segment, it's actually three segment resection. I mean, it's all like a individual patient selection. I, it, it, it's come to the, you know, at the end of the day, you have to select the patient very well. If the patient is very good and patient is willing to take the risk, you know, probably you can go ahead. Touch wood, my patient is doing really good. Okay, so I'll, I'll go back to the algorithm. Please wait. Um, I think PGs can take one single, if they want to say no, say this in a single sentence, they can say any decompensated liver patient, no resection. Okay, it's only in a compensated liver disease patient, we talk about who we can resect, who we cannot resect. That's so right. All these criteria will apply only for a compensated liver disease. Decompensated, no resection. So in single line, PGs can say it. That's, that's very well simplified. So yeah. we have done one centimeter, two centimeters, and three centimeters single lesions. So Hema, there's one point we have never covered. What about the one centimeter HCC where you have a, a, a doubtful lesion? 
what is your take on observation in these patients and how do you follow them up? So it depends on that one centimeter lesion is picked up in which imaging. So suppose if you're picking it up uh, on ultrasound, so you have to do a contrast imaging. So either a CT scan or an MRI. And uh, it, we may have a very, very well uh, typical imaging features of HCC, we may not have it. So usually when it is less than one centimeter, we have to observe the lesion. So we have to observe means we have to do serial imaging. So we have to do the next imaging at three months, three months, three months. So if there is a growth of the size of the lesion, that means it, it will fit into the LIRAD spore, it will move up. So that means that is typical of HCC. If it does not, it is very difficult in cirrhotic patients, especially to differentiate a dysplastic nodule from a real neoplastic nodule. So that is why uh, there is the confusion. So you look, there is one sediment lesion, repeat the imaging at three months and then see. So that, that is the key factor you should remember. If the lesion is less than one centimeter and there is highly suspicious of HCC. The next follow-up scan should be a CT scan, should be done at three months, not six so months. Normal, so remember that normal surveillance uh, CT scan in a cirrhosis is at six months. Usually we, we screen them every six months in cirrhotics. But once you have a doubtful lesion at one, one, less than one centimeter, the next imaging is at three, centi uh, three months. So here we go to the next uh, size, it's a single tumor, say five centimeters. Whenever the lesion crosses three centimeters, ablation falls off. There is no safe ablation for patients with tumors of more than three centimeters. So that, I think I wanted to make that clear. So once you cross that ablation falls off, and any tumor more than three centimeters requ um, requires an arterial therapy for bridging or uh, downstaging. And uh, we still have the option of resection and transplantation in these patients. Now Milan criteria is a single tumor, five centimeters, and the UCSF has a single tumor of 6.5 centimeters. So let me pull up. 6.5 centimeters is really large for resections, but I think hanging tumors, like the one sitting on the lower edge of the tumor and hanging out, the size being six centimeters, it's still, you will not remove much of the non-tumor liver and it's probably much more easier to do. They are still resectable lesions. Um, on uh, the other deeply placed tumors, I think arterial therapies and transplantation are the best possible ones. Uh, Mahesh, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree completely. Again, if the, patient's, uh, if the patient is non-serotic, uh, if the lesion is, sometimes we do see non-serotic liver also, we see some HCCs. In those cases, obviously, uh, depending upon where the lesion is, we can go for either even hemiapatectomy, like uh, three or four segments we can remove. If the patient is cirrhotic, then we need to follow the rules of cirrhosis. If it's a uh, uh, you know, good uh, liver status, still we can go ahead for resection, even with 6.5 or 5. But again, if the liver function is not good and the patient is probably going to be a transplant, then we need to think about the bridging therapy or downstaging therapy. Mahesh, I have I've, I've broken down it for the understanding yes. of the... The screen the is not person. moving. The screen is not moving. I'm just looking for it. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go back. It's a single share. lesion after that. It's not moving at all. Okay. Some problem is happening. Okay. Bindam Hema can take the questions in the... So there are some questions here. So there are questions which they have asked is, uh, do you do, Mahesh, can, do you do liver volumetry even in normal background liver for smaller tumors? Uh, if I'm, you know, like eyeball test, if I see the CT scan, if I think the remnant liver is going to be you know, good enough, I don't usually do liver volumetry. Unless otherwise I have a doubt, I don't usually do it. So small tumors, we usually eyeball. How do we calculate the functional liver remnant? So it is done radiologically. Mm -hmm. That's the question. How do you calculate the functional liver remnant? I think usually we ask for the radiologist. We calculate the whole liver volume and then we can calculate the, the amount of liver that we are going to remove. Then we can subtract. We can, for example, how many percentage of liver that we are going to take. Uh, as Yelongo mentioned, ideally we leave about 40% of the remnant liver. That's what we do. But obviously it's been calculated by the radiologist for each and every segment they go around there is a uh, dedicated software to calculate the liver volume for. So there is a, a question from Parekh. For surface tumors, two centimeter, ablation or surgery? Surface tumor, better to go ahead with the surgery if the liver function is good. Good. In non-serotic liver, next question, non-serotic liver with HCC, 
is biopsy indicated? So no. probably uh, it is uh, depending on the imaging. What do you say, Mahesh? No, I think usually if the if the lesion has a typical character of arterial phase enhancement with the venous washout, we most of the time we are certain it's an HCC. In those cases, I won't do any biopsy. If the diagnosis, you know, it's not very straightforward, or if we are suspecting something else rather than HCC. For example, if there is a lesion in the liver, but we don't know whether it is a primary or secondary or something. Or if we think the patient is not going to benefit from surgery, only option is apparative care, then we need to think about doing a biopsy. But generally, we don't biopsy this. Yes. Okay. Uh, is my screen back? Yep. Yes, it's a back. Uh, do you have all the details now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like I've me messed up a lot. Okay. <laughs> no, no, not so, so for a five centimeter lesion, um, we again look for clinically significant portal hypertension. Mm -hmm. And if there is no clinically significant portal hypertension, you can still attempt a resection. If there is clinically significant portal hypertension, bridge therapy with arterial therapies, like your cutoff point your ma uh, is crossed. So you have to uh, do arterial therapies followed by listing for liver transplantation. It's the same for um, uh, lesions around 6.5 centimeters. You bridge okay. followed by transplant. Uh, is it moving now? Yeah, 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 it's moving now. So, uh, can I go back and uh, do some more uh, case studies before we proceed? Yeah. Uh, any any questions from the audience? Please, any verbal questions? Please feel free. Yeah, Ankit. Sir, this algorithm is uh, underlying cirrhotic uh, liver, sir. Yes. Sir, yeah. five centimeter tumor is there, an underlying back, background cirrhotic liver. Uh, if uh, clinically significant portal hypertension is not there, even then also how, uh, resectable, resection is feasible, sir. Five it's, centimeter is too big, sir. It's it's too big. It's too big, but it depends on the position, your lower margin, your size of the liver. Uh, we have we just discussed that before. So I think if you if it is in a suitable place, you do the resection. If it yeah. is not, just go ahead with the bridge therapy followed by transplantation. Got it? Hello? But yeah. five, centim five centimeter single tumor, uh, uh, no need to uh, go for a bridge. You know, if it's fulfilled the, fulfill the Milan criteria, we can go directly for transplant so, also, sir. Yeah, we can go ahead for transplantation if you have a donor right, right with yeah. you. Living you donor. Right? Okay. Living donor, you can go ahead, straight ahead with transplant. You can do that. But, you know, uh, the bridging therapy actually gives you an option to look at the biology of the tumor in situ. So right. most of the transplant centers recommend that. But you actually can go ahead without a bridge therapy in these situations if you have a trans if you have a live donor. Yeah, Ashish Bansal. Sir, if you do a PET scan and you find few lymph nodes in the abdomen with low SUV uptake, how you tackle them for making decision in SCC, sir? So, um, Mahesh, would you like to answer that? Is it cirrhotic or non-cirrhotic? That is the patient question. is childish cirrhotic with the uh, multifocal SCC within Milan's criteria. So in those situation, I think what we have to do is we need to. Uh, it's, it's actually lymph node uptake. Usually the HCCs they go to uh, lymph node, but majority of the time they go to the lungs and then bones. That's why we always do that. But there are instances where we can get a lymph node metastasis as well. If the tumor is FDG uptake, but the lymph nodes are not FDG uptake, it's safe to wait and watch. And sir, tumor is also not very much SUV uptake. Tumor SUV is almost 3.5 and lymph node SUV is 3. So okay. do we give importance to those lymph nodes or thus we can ignore them? It's not, we, never, we, we should never ignore these kind of findings. What we need to do is we need to keep an eye on them all with the follow-up images and if Time of if we have still strong suspicion there is a lymph node which is enlarged that you want to you know make sure there is no tumor in it at the time of transplant the first thing you do is take a lymph node and send for a frozen section if the frozen section come back as positive it considered as an extra hepatic disease in those situation you would not proceed with the transplant yeah uh, DB whoever that is what is your question. Uh, sir, in con uh, good afternoon, sir. In continuity with the last question, mm -hmm. if the lymph if the lymph node in HDL is positive, yeah, uh, is it a contraindication for resection? 
this depending upon the liver if the liver is cirrhotic or non cirrhotic some instances we can, we have taken the uh, primary lesion along with some lymphadenectomy but again when there is a lymph node positivity it's considered as extra hepatic disease in those situation we need to treat the patient as a distant disease like you know whatever the uh, options are either palliative uh, mode of treatment or best supportive care uh, i think i think that our symptomatic treatment, that's what we need to offer for those patients ilango so, do you agree uh, yeah i agree actually uh, if you look so at the you PCR mean only treatment. option is serafinib um, there are a lot of options not only serafinib recently there are few other uh, options like lenvatinib and regorafenib and these are all the yeah. new medicines that have come compared to there are a lot of trials going on between serafinib and the other uh, uh, monoclonal antibody therapy i think the the latest ones like lenvatinib and regorafenib they have superior mesh is the voice clear hello yeah i think uh, did you did you hear pansa yeah the last one got garbled <laughs> i don't know whether did you guys hear me uh, with the answer the last sentence you know yes yeah, sir yeah, you are clear sir you are clear okay, sir thank you thank you okay fine uh, sir my second question is yes. a multiple uh, multiple hcc uh -huh. in the background there is uh, the liver is normal uh, so what is your size and number criteria for the resection so any multiple hcc for example if you can you know if the liver if there is no extra hepatic disease if we can leave enough remnant liver even if there is three or four on the one side if we can resect it that is if there is a young patient you know probably we can attempt that but if it is bilateral low bar i think we should still consider as you know advanced disease and uh, put them on the you know stage d stage d or advanced disease uh, criteria and then treat them with the palliative option right the um kush pari what is your question uh sir when we go for a resection of hcc do we prefer a segmental resection or a negative margin resection as preferred like we do for colorectal liver mets you know do you want to take that or sorry sorry you okay, please ask the question again you know he's asking whether when we go for resection we go for anatomical segmental resection or uh, like or you do like a non anatomical resection like a colorectal liver met so in a Uh, in a non serotic liver we go for the anatomical resection as much as possible the um, if it cro i i don't do bilobar disease for hcc anyway um, for resections i i still feel it is a very uh, very advanced tumor uh, but as long as it's confined within one lobe we can go ahead and do an anatomical resection correct and uh, yeah that's how i have been approaching no one thing i ilanga i just want to you know ask your opinion also in this regard there are papers coming up about regarding anatomical versus non anatomical resection and uh, i always do non anatomical resection and i rarely go for anatomical resection specifically if i'm doing a right lobe or left lobe or left lateral segmentectomy i go up behind the vessels and ligate them first and take the whole lobe but if it is in segment 7 or segment 8 if i can achieve a good tumor margin for example a 0.5 cm usually i go for non anatomical resection and there are papers saying that anatomical is better some papers is non anatomical is safe enough to go ahead and do it the recurrence rates are not you know no difference between these two resections what's your preference as as long as you get a good margin it either one is fine but i always yeah. find it difficult to do uh, a proper resections in in non anatomical resections in lesions that are close to the hepatic veins correct so i always uh, lose on the deeper plane so at that time i am very very careful okay Now, apart from that i think uh, as long as you have a good margin it does not matter okay back to you elango continue uh, so, uh, sir uh, one more thing sir what do we consider it as adequate margin is it 1 cm or 5 mm my issue want to take that a cm is good i i think i think 5 mm is enough and uh, if you take 1 cm that's also good enough i don't think there is a standard criteria how much you take it but generally if you have a negative resection margin that's enough thank you sir yeah hello so <clears throat> so if you look at the chart now i'm i am i is the slide uh, visible on the mind map yeah. okay so the bridge is a, a criteria which fulfills the ucsf criteria and then you have a waiting time so that is called a bridge 
or and if the tumor size is larger than the size specified under the UCSF criteria, we call that a downstaging. It's very, very important for you to understand that uh, UNOS requires that you require a downstaging to, you, to Milan for you to get that score uh, to the, uh, the additional MELD exception points. So uh, this also helps us identify people with bad biology. When you downstage with arterial therapies, the patients whose biology is aggressive will develop either metastasis or the tumor will break forth, or there'll be an increase in AFP, which will give you an indication to avoid transplants in these patients. Because even if you follow them up with transplantation, they will, get a, uh, they will have recurrent tumors. Um, so your aim is to keep the recurrence around eight to 10 percentage in a HCC transplant. So any tumor, this is the cutoff point, 10 centimeters, anything beyond, you have to downstage um, there is a specific criteria for that. We'll discuss that uh, on the downstaging details. The other one, the next uh, single tumor is one with an AFP more than 1,000. So again, an AFP more than 1,000 indicates a bad biology. Apart from the size, you must understand that AFP also is playing a role to identify the patient who has probably a very badly behaving tumor. Again, the option is to uh, do arterial therapies first and not go for transplantation, even if the tumor is of smaller size. Um, if the AFP is more than 1,000, you go ahead for arterial therapies and see whether the AFP drops down to less than 400 before you actually put them on the transplant list. So you downstage again, followed by transplantation. So this is the option here. Um, now, when you have multiple lesions, you have to identify the liver-specific tumor burden by two, uh, uh, two size criteria and the biologic criteria by measuring AFPs. Now, the largest size uh, of the multiple tumors are variable between 3 centimeters, 4.5 centimeters for, uh, in the UCSF. In both these, they fit into the criteria for transplantation, and you can either do a direct transplantation if you have a donor, or you can bridge them when they are going to wait for transplantation. Anybody more than five centimeters, you again downstage, you can downstage them by using arterial therapies followed, followed, with, uh, followed by transplantation. A cumulative size of eight centimeters is the cutoff limit at the UCSF for transplantation. And if you have more than eight centimeters, your option is again bridge downstage with arterial therapies and transplantation. I'm doing this repeatedly because I want you to understand that if the size criteria or the biological criteria exceeds that for the transplant lesions, you attempt an arterial therapy, downstage them, and bring them back to the transplant criteria if possible. And once Milan is satisfied or UCSF is satisfied in some programs, you can go ahead with transplantation. Like with AFP, also in multiple lesions, if it's more than 1,000, you can, you can downstage them with arterial therapies and transplantation. Now, if, if I'm clear, I would just like to go into one of the... Um, Ilanga, one thing here is that uh, multiple lesions for the transplant criteria, we need to make sure that the number of lesions should not be more than three. More than three? Three. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, if you remember the algorithm, mm. um, the number of lesions, more than four, I have actually dropped them to medical treatment. Okay, okay, it's gone. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. So, so that's, that's how it is. And um, I want to see one, I want to share one more share here. So there is one question here. So okay. rupture HCC, is it a contraindication for liver transplant? Mahesh, you can take it. Ruptured HCC, is it a contraindication uh, for liver transplant? Most of the time, yes, because we don't know whether it has gone into the peritoneal seedling or not. Most of the time, they come as an emergency where you don't think about transplant option. Majority of the time, they end up having an emergency laparotomy and removal of the lesion. And at that point, we try to give as much as wash as possible. But thing is, once it ruptured, we don't know whether it is uh, gone, become like an extra hepatic disease. That is, uh, you know, one of the difficult situation to decide whether this patient will fit the criteria of a transplant or not later. But most of the time, they, uh, they don't go for transplant. Yes. Uh, that's a clear one. Yeah. Uh, is my slide visible now to everyone? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you have, 
you have a 56 year old HCC, three numbers. They are labeled as 4.5 centimeters, the largest one, 3.5 and one centimeters. It's a Nash cirrhosis. CTP is A6. There is no portal venous involvement and the metastatic workup is negative. AFP is less than 200. So pretty much only the cumulative number is slightly more than eight, eight centimeters. So what do we do? So this is how we do, uh, we evaluate the fitness for transplantation. We look for taste contraindications. So now uh, we'll give you a little more details. The taste contraindication is a bilirubin of more than three milligrams per deciliter. The post taste decompensation at this point is usually high. And if it is acceptable, if the bilirubin is less than three, we proceed with downstaging with taste. And the taste response is assessed at three months by a contrast CT scan which also can show the biological behavior as I shared earlier. And if the lesion regresses and falls within UCSF, and there are no contraindications to transplant, you can either do an LDLT at that point of time or keep them on the wait list till you get the uh, uh, disease donor liver. Now, uh, this is the indication for taste in HCC. There should be no extrahepatic disease. There should not be any main portal vein thrombosis. Segmental portal vein thrombosis, there are some people who do a uh, highly selective taste. Um, tumor involvement should be less than 50% of the liver parenchyma. And um, the tumor should be more than three centimeters for them, for them to uh, actually use this as their treatment modality. The good performance status is required. And uh, you should also have a well-preserved liver function without encephalopathy. And ascites must be very minimal. Their, cre their creatinine should be uh, less than two and uh, platelet count and uh, prothrombin activity should also be checked. And doxorubicin is the material that is used for the ablation, uh, transarterial ablation. So you need to look for the left ventricular ejection fraction should be more than 50%, good cardiac function. And the white cell count must be appropriate. So you do a taste. Uh, Dr. Hema, uh, do you have any other, uh, any other thing to add? If what would you, in our program, we are using TER and what is your, uh, what is your uh, um, opinion regarding the use of tear in these lesions? So, uh, so in a BCLC B, so that means in tear has got specific indications where it, it scores over tears. So tear is transarterial radio embolization. So one situation where it scores above tears is when it has when the patient has got a portal vein thrombus. In the rest of the patients. So five to eight centimeter lesions without portal vein thrombus, both of them has got equal efficacy. So the tear has not been shown to have, shown to have any excess uh, efficacy than this. So I think unless the patient has uh, uh, a portal vein thrombus or very, very large tumors, eight centimeters, then probably I will consider tear. Otherwise, most patients I will submit them to TAS. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Well, well, the uh, the bilirubin criteria for tear is it different from taste? So yes, so slightly lower. So even less, uh, about two milligrams itself, we will not uh, we may not do uh, tear. Tear. Okay. So now we have one more case, which is a sixty-year-old gentleman with Nash cirrhosis, HCC twelve centimeters. It's a solitary lesion, an AFP of thousand, seven thousand. So what are the options? How would you go ahead with this? I can see the slide. So, so basically, yeah, uh, Mahesh can take her. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. I think the, the AFP of 7000 itself says is a bad biology of the tumor. And uh, this patient, I wouldn't think about uh, in like a transplant option, even, you know, downstaging. I don't know whether even that is the right way to go ahead here. And uh, this patient, we have to look at the, what is the performance status? Performance status is good. And if the lesion is, you know, uh, one-sided where there is a possibility of resection, yes, we can try the good liver function. But transplant option, I would think twice before doing anything for this patient. I don't know whether him would you agree or? No, well, he is not a transplant candidate, no. So if he has to go for it. Up to seven criteria, five criteria. What is that? Current so, um, my, oh, you just put this info. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I got it. 
I think this patient would go for best palliative care. So, um, Hema also feels that best palliative care is probably the, the only option. So, you so, have both the, both the bad criteria. You have a large sized tumor and, and, you have a, and you have a bad biology reflected by the high AFP. But still, I personally feel that in a good performance status, when the patient says, I want to try, taste or tear is still an option. You can downstage it and try. If the lesion does not downstage, then you go for best palliative care. At this point of time, if the patient has got a good performance status, I would, I would uh, find it very difficult to recommend best supportive care. So, Ilango, so that is what is I want. If it is one side, right? If in a good performance stage, is good liver function, safe to do right apatectomy, 12 centimeter lesion, would you go ahead with the right apatectomy? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking, you know. If, even if it is AFP 7000, if it is single sided, easily resectable, good performance status, good liver function, without, I mean, like obviously, oh, there's a cirrhosis. I, one, I of the, one of the counseling, one of the counseling, what I would do is that. Um, there is a high chance of recurrence. That I would do that. Yeah, and yeah. I would be more aggressive on the metastatic workup. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to one more case with uh, transplantation. So here is a 49. Yeah. 49. yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, this tumor, 12 centimeter and alpha fibroprotein is uh, very high. So if we are planning downstaging with the help of taste, so after how many cycles of taste we should declare that now you go for palliative care? How many cycles uh, we should try? So you do the first one. Yes, sir. You do the first one. You should see that is the choice uh, criteria which I which I had written now. So trans for transplant selection you have to meet this. If it is more than thousand, you have to repeat taste. Your alpha fetoprotein should come down to less than four hundred. And the tumor also size has to come down to four centimeters. You got it? So 400 and four centimeters is the cutoff for transplant. Yeah. yeah. So oh. should come down to, yeah. Thank you. So his Ankit also wants to know when will you say, okay, he is a taste failure. Yes. So yes. he's not responding to taste at all. And when will, when are you going to put this patient to only to palliative care? Yes. So, so that means, so for that, you generally give two sessions. So after two sessions of taste, if there is no significant necrosis, there's no reduction in size, even if, uh, even if uh, leave alone the transplant criteria, if there is no reduction in size, there's no significant necrosis, that means he is refracted to taste. So these patients will have to go on only best supportive care. Or, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got it? Yeah. 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 So we have a, a a 49 year old uh, male patient with Nash cirrhosis with HCC within US, UCSF. Now he come for liver transplantation. Now you have done the transplantation and the liver allograft function is stable. And uh, what is your take on the immunosuppressive plan? And I want the answer from both the sides. I want Mahesh to answer this and Hema to answer this because I think surgeons may also differ uh, in, this, in these protocols. So yeah. what I do is, uh, so Bacilliximab, use of induction Bacilliximab, it, uh, generally we are not using it as a routine. We are only using it in a patient with a possible renal, pre-existing renal injury, or we feel that he's going to go for a renal injury, then only we use Bacilliximab. Otherwise, in the beginning, it's going to be standard immunosuppression, uh, triple immunosuppression. So steroids, CNI, and uh, MMF. But by the end of one month or two months, we would like to come down on tacrolimus. We cannot stop it, but we would like to come down on the levels of tacrolimus because CNIs has got a proliferative effect on the tumors. That's what we saw. So we, we will put them on everolimus two to three months. I think we also agree with the same thing. You know, obviously for any, we don't usually give any induction for any of our liver transplant patients, apart from okay. steroid. We can never give map. we never give uh, thymoglobin unless otherwise the patient serum creatinine is more than 1.5. That means they have some pre-existing renal disease. In that case, you want to delay the CNA induction, you, you can give map. But in Indian setup, I've never given map for any of our patients. And again, regarding the post-op immunosuppression, the standard protocol, you go for triple and then try to wean off uh, or reduce the dose of CNIs by the end of three months. 
So you can by the after the at the end of three months, you can think about reducing the dose of tacro as well as you can slowly introduce everodimus and you can go for uh, you know dual therapy from month three. That would be the majority of the units throughout the world are following that. The one thing that we have done in Cleveland is we categorize them into high risk category and low risk category depending upon the pathology. So if the patient has got multifocal tumor on the explant pathology or if the patient has got any vascular invasion on the pathology or the tumor grade is you know more than two then probably these patients there is a high risk for recurrence. In those patients sometimes we may think about starting the everlimus earlier than three months and for those patients also we do aggressive surveillance like three monthly CTs, four monthly CT scan for two years but if the low risk category where there is no tumor found on the explant pathology or there is no any vascular invasion then those patients go on low risk category for them we do say a four month CT scan for one year and then six monthly for two years and then yearly those patients we wait even sometimes after three months you know the graft function is not stable enough we may still delay a little bit but three months is the most of the time is a cutoff point where everyone tried to change the immunosuppression from uh, CNA from CNA plus to Everolimus. Yeah, uh, we, we also follow uh, many people asking what is seven seven four no. four criteria. So it's usually listed as that's a slide prepared for my note. So uh, I have to explain that I've been seeing these questions now. Yeah, the up to seven criteria. The up to seven criteria is takes the size of the largest lesion and the number of lesions. Together, the sum must be seven. And when you have a high AFP and you downstage them, the sum must be less than four. So that is the criteria, you understand? The first four stands for the size and the second four stands for the number of lesions. So the sum should be four, five or seven. The size plus the number of lesions, you get it? Or do you want any any detailed explanation? Yes, so uh, that seven seven criteria is the way I write my notes. Unfortunately, it has got into my slide, and I just realized only when you asked a question. Uh, I would be careful to see um, my own uh, deficiencies in uh, remembering things coming up on the slides. Uh, is it clear, uh, Dr. Tony Jones? Okay, I'll continue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so that's it. So, what? One more slide. Um, so now we have a 42-year-old male with HCV cirrhosis. Now that's a slightly complicated one, and I wanted to add one more layer because uh, not all the time we have uh, Nash cirrhosis and HCV is going for transplant. We get from Hep C's also, and uh, it's uh, 4.5 centimeters in the right lobe. Meld is 15. CTP B9 and uh, uh, clinically significant portal hypertension, obviously, transplant is indicated. But my key question is uh, whether Dr. Hamer will agree with our protocol. Uh, it's transplant or treat or treat or transplant, treat and transplant. What would you do? So, uh, so the main problem with the hepatitis C and HCC, so our transplant, a liver transplant is that if you go with a positive virus into the transplant, there is going to be a flare and a uh, the graft will fail after the transplant. So if possible, if we can make the patient, uh, patient RNA negative before the transplant, that is the best option. So as you have written, so if the MELD mel score is less than 19 or 20, and you also have a donor, you can treat the virus first and then go for the transplant. And especially at four weeks, generally they become negative. And if you have a living donor, you can, uh, you can go after that. But suppose if the MELD score is more than 20, patient is already decompensated. They may worsen sometimes when you start them on the direct acting agents. So in those patients, we will have to probably go for transplant and then treat it. And uh, once uh, immediately after the transplant, as soon as the liver functions are stable, maybe as early as 15 days or maybe usually around one or two months, we can start the antivirals. But I would prefer generally, if possible, to treat the virus before we go for transplant. Thank you, thank you, Hema. And um, am I right in saying that uh, if the MELD score is more than 20, the patient has refractory ascites and hepatic encephalopathy, you would still uh, treat the HIV post transplant, HCV post transplant, is that correct? Yep. Yes, if you have a, 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 it's usually then we can treat it post transplant, but there, there may be situations when we don't have a donor and patient is waiting for the 
for a disease donor ca cadaver, then you have no option that you have to treat it. You have to accept the complications, you have to accept the risk, and then go ahead and treat the virus. So thank you, thank you for both the panelists. I think we have had a good discussion. So Ankit, what I want to have a question. Ankit keeps uh, raising his hand all the time. What's your question? Yeah. Sir, uh, here uh, actually, if patient having HCV related cirrhosis with HCC and uh, patient is liver transplant candidate and male is more than 25. So here there are a lot of controversy. Some people and uh, uh, patient is liver transplant awaiting and if period is more than six months. So a lot of people are telling don't give direct acting agent. By the time you just do the down staging uh, and uh, uh, once a patient got an uh, organ, do transplant. But uh, as per the literature, as per the ESL guideline, what they are recommending DA if transplant periodic six months or more. Because there is an entity called mailed purgatory. Because sometimes what will happen, it will the down, the, the mail will come and the, uh, the priority of the patient will reduce. So in that situation, it's a lot of controversy is there. So what to do, sir, ideally? So the concept of mailed purgatory, so that, is, that usually uh, applies to the Western uh, World where the the organ allocation is based on meld. So like patient, uh, he gets a meld exception or he, his original meld is something like, uh, let's say 32. So he's high up on the list. He would treat his uh, HCV. It will come down. It will come down to something like 25 or 26. He still needs a transplant, but then he loses the advantage of waiting on the waiting list. So that is called as meld purgatory. So in our country, I think it's not that complicated. So either we have a donor and we go ahead and do it. If we don't have a donor and we have a waiting time of more than six months, we go ahead and treat. So I think uh, we don't have to worry about the milled purgatory in Indian scenarios. So can uh, I, write, uh, can I before, before transplant, can I start uh, antiviral treatment milled? If a transplant waiting period is more than six months? Uh, I think we have to explain the risk that patient may decompensate further and, and you can start it. You explain uh, and then you start it, yes. Okay, thank you, Hema. Dr. TJB, Bala, what is your point? Uh, actually, at the end, I will, I will come because yeah. I have some uh, very pertinent questions. I'll, I'll come at the end. Okay, Bala. DB? Hello. Yes. Uh, so, my question is uh, can we start in, in case of hepatitis B or C before going for resection? Is there any indication for to treat hepatitis B and C before resection, or we should treat it after resection? I think uh, so. Mother, so when when we're talking about resection, that means we are presuming that uh, you know the underlying liver function is good. So yes, hepatitis B, there is no problem. You can treat. And uh, hepatitis C, the, uh, when we say that we're talking about resection. Underlying liver function is good, so yes, we can treat. But do you do, I mean, resection and treat or treat and resection? That's what I, his question, I guess. So, yes, uh, uh, I think there's, really there should be no harm in probably waiting for four. At four weeks, most patients will become uh, RNA negative. So, you can wait for four weeks and go ahead and do it. I think that's mm -hmm. ideal approach. Uh, one, obviously, you make the patient sustained, uh, you know, uh, SVR uh, response like the, the virus will, will go, will, RNA will go down. Second thing, you know, let's put the, put the risk a little bit on the lower side on the healthcare profession also. So, you, you mean uh, we have to wait for four, four weeks? We have to give antivirals for the four, four weeks before resection? Yeah, yeah. The, the reason for four weeks is most of, the, most of the patients will become virus negative by four weeks. The, the course will be for 12 weeks and the sustained viral response, we have to wait for six months. We don't have that much time to wait. So Correct. four weeks is reasonable time to wait. By that time, most patients will, be, will become virus negative. And anything, is there anything like that, that we should not uh, discontinue the medicine for more than seven days? Yes, yes. As, long as, as far as possible, there should be no discontinuity. Because there must be a discontinuity when we will do the surgery. No, uh, it's okay. For liver resection, uh, there need not be any discontinuity. on the Because it, uh, liver resections, generally, they permit orals, at least the liquids the next day or at least the day after, they do permit. So, because there is no problem, they are not touching the bowel. So, they, right. they can take it. Okay, okay. back to Elango. Um, 
that uh, uh, you can actually ask more questions if you have. That is pretty much the overview of HCC treatment. What I would like to go through is I would like to get individual consultants uh, who do these therapies and uh, give you a little more detail on the individual therapies like ablation, the arterial therapies. The arterial therapies are of two types, the chemo embolization and the radio embolization. And we will also look at uh, some questions with resection and transplantation with m myself and Mahesh Vrindpichamuthu. And we will also try to Im invite uh, a couple of our transplant friends who can uh, share their experience as well. So uh, we will probably uh, schedule the We need to have a few more sessions on, uh, uh, on these lines so for uh, the audience to get a lot more uh, sort of uh, clarity on this. Sort of clarity on this is required. Yeah. Uh, if we are done, uh, and yeah. you, uh, an announcement before it, uh, Bal, uh, TG Balchander comes with his uh, comments and questions. On Monday, we're going to have a brilliant session on COVID and surgery and surgeons. Uh, uh, that panel discussion will be led by none other than Ilango with his uh, COVID friends, or whoever. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, pre pre operative management, hospital admission protocols, uh, theater protocols, post operative protocols, because there's a huge confusion all over the country regarding this. So we have a couple of people uh, coming up with their own protocols and we have a little better understanding about this. That will be on Monday. Uh, uh, Bala, what are, your, what, is your, what, are, what are your comments? Oh, I have a few questions and comments. Can you listen, hear me? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, it's a, uh, see, regarding the liver biopsy before transplantation, uh, we do the biopsy of the tumor and we have do biopsy of the normal liver. I remember once uh, in one meeting, Ilango himself said, nowadays in United States, they do a liver biopsy before liver transplantation for litigation purpose or something. I just want clarity from him. Um, sir, we don't do liver biopsies as a routine. I think Lyrats 5 is, uh, I don't know whether I messed up the, my message in any of the presentations. Biopsy is not routine. Eh? But it, nowadays in the US, they have yeah. started doing it. That's what I, I heard something about. What's Mahesh, you are mm -hmm. from Cleveland. What's your take on this? We, sir, we never do biopsies, sir. Because the, obviously, if you're planning for transplant, we don't want to breach the tumor plane by doing a biopsy. That's the main thing. And if you're planning for a resection, sometimes to assess the liver function, we do biopsy of the normal liver, not the tumor still. But they say the tumor seedling rate is about 0 0.5 to less than 5% or whatever it is. And of recent literature, I read somewhere that they have come up with some special needles where the tumor needle tract is almost 0%. And they say you're going to do that biopsy and immediately you're going to do the transplantation. So there is no question of any causing any uh, tract or whatever it is because you're going to take the patient immediately no? before transplantation. Um, sir. Uh, yeah, Mahesh, go ahead. There's no waiting period. There's no waiting period. The, the problem is, sir, you know, um, if you're, you know, the, the needle tract treatment is different. For example, if you're doing a local regional therapy, for example, if you're doing RFA, you do the tumor and then you ablate the tract also all the way to the skin. That is a different uh, way. Yeah. For biopsy, I don't think anybody does treatment for the needle tract. One. Number two is, even if you're doing, for example, if you're doing a biopsy today and doing a transplant tomorrow, we don't know whether have we spilled any tumor cells on the tract. It is very difficult to say yes or no. You're, you're right. The, the incidence of needle tract seedling is 0.5 and less than 5%. Usually, we roughly we tell it's around 1%. But still, mm. we think, you know, as a transplant community, people think 1% is still a, a big number uh, to do a procedure of, you know, uh, high end like transplantation and then if the patient recurs on the skin that's going to be a female transplantation that's why people always be cautious on not biopsying the tumor that is my take from Cleveland as well as from Birmingham sir. Yeah, my next uh, question can I shoot? Yes yeah, sir. sir. Yeah. You, want to say See, you are following Millen criteria and Millen criteria is said to be an anatomical criteria Whereas BCLC is said to be, it also 
it's a physiological criteria besides anatomical. Some of the Eastern European countries, I think, and I'm not sure, following the BCLC. What's your comment on this? So, um, the Milan's criteria is a selection criteria for transplant. The BCLC is a staging system that uh, will enable you to choose the appropriate uh, therapy. So, they are completely different systems. In the BCLC, I think uh, once you have transplantation as the option, you can use the Milan criteria for organ allocation. Ayesh, Hema? I agree. I think, uh, it's, uh, BCLC is actually to decide which type of treatment we are going to give for STC. Yeah. As well as some more criteria called HALT, HCC. They are all the criteria to decide you know, whether we can go for transplant or not. Or we can assess the risk of post-transplant recurrence also with this information. That's the take from, from my side, sir. My another question is, hepatocellular carcinoma is a very aggressive tumor in the background of a chronic liver disease caused by mostly alcohol, hepatitis B in our country. A patient, I was listening to Hema someone, a patient who is infected with hepatitis B, who needs a transplantation, what is her criteria? So, oh, hepatitis, so hepatitis B is a common cause for uh, cirrhosis and hepatitis B. Active hepatitis B disease waiting for transplant with super added HCC. So, yes, yeah, so that is very complicated. The main reason is so there is an uh, active, if the pa it all depends on whether the patient has got an active hepatitis B. So active means uh, uh, whether he's having a flare. So suppose if he's having jaundice because of the flare, that means he may not be suitable for any of the regional therapies. So be, uh, that I'm, not, means, uh, I'm not bothered about jaundice. I'm not bothered about it. What the textbook says, you are talking about with hepatitis C and you will see, you will go on the background of the viral load, isn't it? You said. But in hepatitis B, somewhere I came across that you give the patient, you start the treatment protocol of hepatitis B and don't depend upon the viral load. See the transaminase levels. If the transaminase levels are less than 100, if the patient is fit enough to go for transplant, go ahead and continue the viral therapy post-operatively. That's what I feel. What's your comment? Yes. Yes, yes definitely. Definitely the antivirus antivirals should be started. Any, any, any detectable virus, detectable yeah. virus, hepatitis B, the patient should be on antivirus, uh, antivirus, yeah. anticaver or a ten of over, irrespective of that, irrespective of the transaminases. So you have, the patient has to be on it. The patient has to be taken through the transplant on the antivirus. And if the patient has got a significantly positive DNA, in addition to the oral drugs, the patient should also get immunoglobulin at the time of transplant, because the new virus will, new liver, sorry, the new liver will also get the virus. So yeah. you remove the diseased liver, you put in the new liver. So we don't want that new liver to get affected. So we have to give immunoglobulin in addition to it. Whereas when you take the patient for transplant, if the virus is not detectable, we can manage without the immunoglobulin. The main problem with the immunoglobulin is the cost, like the, it will, the cost will just go up by another 7 to 8 lakhs. Bala, there are a few more people asked waiting for questions. Okay. That's, tell so tell much. Tell That's all. Thank you. Us, uh, Banot, what is your question? Uh, any other uh, questions from the audience, please, before we close the Good session? evening, sir. Good evening, yeah. sir. Can I ask my question? Yeah. Suppose on imaging model, uh, suppose on imaging, uh, imaging a uh, HCC tumor, there are disc discordant results and alpha phytoprotein is not significantly elevated. Still, you will not consider a biopsy, sir? Sorry, we're not able to get the question. What is that? The tumor size is big suppose enough. On, suppose on imaging, you are getting a discordant results, and okay. alpha phytoprotein is also not significantly elevated. Still, you will not consider a biopsy in such a case, sir? No. 
um, I think some of the patients are non AFP secretors. In those patients, you don't have uh, AFP level elevated. Sometimes you may have a normal AFP, but according to the LIRAD criteria, if it fits criteria like the, we have a classical um, arterial phase enhancement and venous washout, we always consider this an HCC. Then again, the treatment depending upon the liver status as well as the tumor cells, what we have discussed so far. I think, uh, uh, we I mean, even in that situation, we try not to take a biopsy unless otherwise you label the patient as a palliative care where you are not going to go for transplant option or any other option, then you are justifying justified in doing a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis for a palliative mode of treatment. So I think uh, Mahesh's question is in, with discordant imaging, imaging results. Suppose, least, suppose you have done, it's not you have very typical. Is, even a oh, CT, even suppose you have done both imaging, CT and MRI, and uh -huh. both are discordant, sir, not suggestive of HCC, then what uh -huh. you'll do, sir? We have, to, oh. we have to do it. Then. In that case, yes, we have to. We have to get the biopsy done. But again, in the, it's, a, it's a very unique situation where we have to counsel the patient very well. Even sometimes there is a possibility of needle tract seedling, or you're agreeing with that. I mean, all this counseling should be done to the patient. In those situations, yes, you have to go for a biopsy. Uh, sir, one more question, sir. In a lesion of one to two centimeter size, how many imaging, imaging modalities you will do, sir? One cross-sectional imaging or two, sir? It's, uh, Srinivas, it's depending upon, you know, if there is a classical feature, uh, one to two centimeter, typical arterial phase enhancement, venous washout, if you confirming HCC, then that's fine. You don't need to repeat the imaging. But if the imaging is not very clear, sometimes we, we call it as a too small to characterize on the CT scan. In those situations, you have to do a dual mode uh, imaging, like you can add an MRI that gives more information regarding the tumor. Uh, like, sir, in diagnostic yes, algorithm. Yes, sir, yes, sir, if there are enough questions from you, there are other people waiting. Dr. Shubharao, uh, Dr. Shubharao, you have a question or something? Okay, I think uh, there are no more questions. Uh, Ilango, shall I close the session? Yeah, sir. Um, and uh, we can do the next session uh, early next week. Yeah. On the individual. It's a, it's a, I should say it's a wonderful session. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mahesh and uh, Dr. Hema. Uh, I, I think we should have two, three more sessions uh, in this particular area for people to get a lot more, uh, uh, say, uh, better understanding of the subject. Thanks. Okay. Sir. Sir, can you, one more thing, you know, if the audience have any questions, is there any possibility they can ask us, you know, via the Learning General Surgery Facebook so that we can also answer for them? Yeah, that is fine. And also you can, uh, uh, yeah, they can do that. And they can also, you can leave your email IDs in this, uh, the chat column. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'll type the email address so that they can... Take yeah. it if they want. Uh, very fast. So, sir, Dr. Ilango, <laughs> Dr. Ilango, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Thank you, sir. And your team of people who have been absorbing your uh, questions also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks Thank once again yeah, for the uh, audience there. Uh, you can see the chat box with uh, Dr. Hema and Dr. Mahesh uh, and also Ilango's email IDs. And please get in touch with them. Feel free, you know, the doctors uh, try to extract as much as knowledge as possible from those who are willing to give just like that. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you.